America's newest political prisoner, Steve Bannon, just got sentenced to four months prison. Unless the Court of Appeals does something to reverse this, he may well see time. We're going to go through the proceedings today. We've got two reporters who are there and are reporting on this on Twitter. We'll go through their threads. Adam Klasfeld over from Long Crime and Sarah Lynch from Reuters. But this is the latest from the docket. And we'll just hit the headline first. This is the juicy bit. Uh, minute entry from the judge sentencing entered. It says proceedings were held before Judge Nichols sentencing on 1021 as to Steve Bannon counts one and two. He was found guilty of both of those counts. These were the counts relating to, as we've called it, the fake illegally constituted January 6th select committee. They were supposed to have a certain number of members appointed. They don't have those members appointed. It was supposed to be five Republicans. There's only two of them. Kinzinger and Cheney are both going to be gone very soon. And in my opinion, it does not comply with H.R. 503, which was the House resolution that constituted this committee. They're supposed to have 13 members. They've got nine. It's not legal. Nevertheless, they sent Steve Bannon over subpoenas, one to show up and testify and another to produce documents. Bannon did not do that. He deferred to his lawyers. His lawyers raised a big issue saying that one of Steve's defenses should be that he was relying on advice of counsel. This is going to be a very big appealable issue. It's certainly going to be the crux of the appeal when we get there, but we'll come back to that. Bannon ultimately did not show in front, up in front of Liz Cheney and they referred this over to Biden's DOJ, which is waging a political war against the mega mega crew. And it turned into criminal indictments for Bannon. Trial went forward. Bannon was precluded from having really any opportunity to defend himself. He wanted to subpoena the January 6th select committee to see what they knew. And, and in particular, how this had become politicized, wasn't allowed to do that. Wanted to introduce a defense of I was relying on my legal counsel's defense, wasn't allowed to do that. Even wanted to introduce documents saying, this is what the DOJ memoranda says about all of this, wasn't allowed to do that. Steve Bannon was in trial, but he didn't really put up a defense at all. And throughout the trial, the judge referenced the case called Licavoli, saying that maybe there is an appealable option there. We'll come back to that. The sentence from Judge Carl J. Nichols is as follows. Defendant is sentenced to four months incarceration to run concurrently, meaning simultaneously with one another. We use these two C words, either concurrently or consecutively in sentencing. Concurrently means they run together. So counts one and two, four month sentences running concurrently. They're running together. If they were consecutive, then they would stack them back to back. They would be four months first on one count and then four months on the other count for a total of eight counts. Didn't do that. Defendant is further ordered to pay a fine of $6,500. And that's not much at all. In fact, Bannon was saying, I'll pay whatever you want. Even his lawyer said that. I'll pay 200 grand, the max, no problem. Tip money, baby. And it was obviously not something that the judge bid on. The judge said, okay, well, money's, money doesn't matter. So he imposed a very minute fine for you know what we're talking about here and instead hit him with prison because that's what really matters. The money, okay, who cares? People who support Steve Bannon, I'm sure would be happy to fund whatever the fine was. What's really powerful is removing Steve from the equation. Can you imagine four months of not having Steve Bannon out there? Chiming away about American politics, becoming a thorn in the side every day on War Room, beating the Democrats politically, peacefully and patriotically every single day, day after day after day. Yeah, it's a big victory for him. So they'd love to see him sidelined. They also are assessing a special assessment of $25. They do this crap all over the place in criminal law. $12 for this, $13 for this, public safety fee, prison construction fund, whatever. $25 for him as well. Sentenced to four months in incarceration. The bond status of the defendant, as we're gonna see, he is released because of course he's going to be appealing this based on Licavoli, which is the case that is sort of in contest, is being contested right now out of the DC circuit. So we'll come back to that. Now that is the latest on the docket. Steve Bannon, when he went into court, he had a message for the people. 
Prior to sentencing, Steve Bannon made an appearance outside of the courtroom and he had a message for the American people and for the Chinese people. Remember, this illegitimate regime, their, their judgment day is on 8 November when the Biden administration ends. I want to thank you all for coming. Thanks. By the way, and remember, take down the CCP. Thank you. Right on. Also, afterthought. I'm about to go in and be sentenced. It might involve federal prison, but also down with the CCP. Now, Steve Bannon's point on this about the Biden administration being sort of out of control very soon, I think is a very astute observation and part of his main defense. Bannon for a long time, I think, has just been sort of unconcerned, nonplussed about any of this stuff. I'm watching him day in and day out go to these different court proceedings, and he says regularly, this is all a scam, not a big deal. We'll just take over the House, we'll take over the Senate, and then we'll take over the presidency. And after that happens, there will be repercussions. Almost like it's part of the defense. And I've been a little bit shocked about the whole thing because it sort of feels cavalier. Because in my practice, we don't have the option to defend our clients, generally speaking, it's never come up, maybe it will one day, of, you know, winning the government of the United States over to get a good outcome. Do we have a lag on the video? I see something about a buffer. Uh-oh. Internet buffer? Might be happening. Yeah, I was running into internet issues today. So, we'll just keep going, see how it goes. Apologies for it. Sorry guys, if it, we're just gonna keep on going. If, you know, the internet's up and down. I had a whole session with the internet people today. They said it was fine. Obviously it's not fine, but we're just gonna keep on going. But that is Steve Bannon, my friend. So before the statement went out, uh, before Bannon went into court for the sentencing proceeding, that's what he uh, had to say for us. Now, we're gonna check in with the reports that came out from several people who were there uh, including Adam Klasfeld. So let's see what Adam Klasfeld had to say uh, on, on our end. Adam Klasfeld says, this is on Steve Bannon. He says, good morning, everybody. We're down here in front of the courthouse. You can see that there was this blow up rat outside of the courthouse for some reason. He says, we're about to begin. Introducing himself for the government is J.P. Cooney and for the defense, David Schoen. U.S. District Court Judge, Judge Nichols, who was appointed by Trump, takes the bench. He's presiding over the case. And there are no witnesses who showed up before the sentencing proceeding. Judge Nichols, he turns over to the sentencing guidelines. And remember, as we've talked about, these are basically big charts, right? These are sort of big spreadsheets that exist. And both sides will use the spreadsheets and sort of bounce around from one chart to the other. The government will say this should go aggressively towards the most serious penalty, and the defense will turn around and say it should go towards the most mitigated, the most minimum penalty. And so we're sort of fighting around these charts. We're moving around these charts, up, down, left, and right, trying to figure out how to settle on this. So Judge Carl Nichols, he comes out and he says, we're, we're just talking right about the sentencing stuff. Let's check in and see what Sarah Lynch had for us to start things off. She was in court as well. And she says, well, she started off later, so we'll pick back up with her later. Now, Nichols takes the bench and he comes out and he says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, before we get started, I have some preliminary findings. Recall that here on this channel, we read through both sentencing memorandums of memoranda from both sides. And before somebody gets sentenced in a criminal case, there's typically three documents a judge looks at, one from the defense, which we read through, one from the prosecutor, which we also read through, and one from a pre-sentence draft writer, somebody typically from a probation department, who's kind of like a neutral third party who is weighing both sides of this and sort of making an independent assessment that goes directly to the judge. So the judge then has a bunch of stuff that they've looked at the day before, right? Judge Nichols in this case is not coming into this thing cold. He, he knows exactly sort of, I, I would guess he knows exactly what he's going to do already. Most of this is just sort of for you know, final touches, 
you know, finishal, finishing flourishes, rhetorical flourishes, and it's to sort of make your impassioned pitch. It's also to see if the defendant wants to say anything and to, you know, to find, kind of finalize it. And so the judge probably knew what he was going to do, but left open the possibility of making a change. But both sides briefed their positions. They came out, they delivered those to Judge Nichols. We read through them all. And they say, Judge Nichols comes out. Okay, well, all right, everybody, before we get started here, I have some uh, preliminary findings I'd like to share with you today. And I was going through the sentencing guideline calculations, including the severity uh, of the offense and the different points. And he says, you know, I was taking a look about this. I have to agree with the government. He says, Steve Bannon, in this case, he's expressed no remorse for his actions. And so that adjusts the chart. We move, we move around the chart a little bit. Now, after the government finished, Bannon's lawyer, David Schoen, gets up. So the government didn't say much, but David Schoen gets up. And he delivers a massive sentencing soliloquy. He says, Your Honor, the government applied the Bannon rule to my client. He was treated differently than many other defendants who've been similarly situated. Schoen is arguing that there's no mandatory minimum. He says, what we have seen here is that this is more analogous to a misdemeanor. And if you take a look at this statute, U.S. Code Section 192, there is a penalty calling for common jail. And that means that we don't have to go to prison. So if we're analogizing this towards a different part of the law, then we can get a different part of a penalty. The other statute that he was charged under, it has a mandatory minimum. But because of the conduct, he's saying we can look at a different part of the sentencing and analogize it over to a different outcome. But Judge Nichols says, yeah, well, hold on a minute. I mean, okay, you're telling me to go to a different provision. That's fine. But if that is a minimum, then isn't it a minimum? Is that maximum not a maximum then? So he goes, okay, so if I can't, if you're saying I can give him probation, can I also give him 30 years in prison? I mean, the statute says it's got a minimum and a maximum. You're saying I can go beyond the minimum. Can I also go beyond the maximum? So a judge is saying, oh, right, you know, sort of playing around with the rules a little bit. And Nichols turns around and he says, well, no, judge, obviously not. And so he's sort of pointing out a contradiction there a little bit. Nichols says, I don't buy it. Judge says, no, I agree. The judge says the statutory minimum and the maximums apply. The government's right on this thing. We're going to just... Apply it as written. Schoen says that they've argued in the past as to why the mandatory minimum doesn't apply. Nichols says, hey, pipe down over there. You've made your argument. You've preserved it. It's on the record. And I reject it. So stop bringing it up. The government came out and said, judge, we think six months is appropriate. And we also ask for $200,000. Prosecutor takes the podium. He says, Your Honor, why do we feel this is appropriate? Simple. The importance of this case has everything to do with the defendant Bannon's obligations as a citizen of the United States. Saying he chose to bring up this, he's saying, saying that he chose to hide behind a fabricated claim of executive privilege and the advice of counsel excuse and then he thumbed his nose at Congress. Prosecutor says, Your Honor, Bannon is not above the law. So the judge turns back to the prosecutor and he says, Okay, well, would this have been different if Bannon did have valid executive privilege, Mr. Prosecutor? I mean, you want to punish him, but what if he did have executive privilege? Prosecutor says, No, no, this, wouldn't, this would not have been different. Judge says, well, why not? Well, the prosecutor says, well, that's, that's because if Bannon had a valid claim, he would have shown up. Prosecutor says, throughout this case, he has acted like he's above the law. He is not. That principle should apply, he says, to those convicted of crimes, regardless of their means, regardless of their station, regardless of the influence of their friends. All right, so this is just typical prosecutor garbage, justice and the law, nobody's above the law and it's travesty and we're all angry and whiner, you know, that's all they do. Big whiny bunch of babies. 
So and they say the same thing in basically every sentencing. It's like a script. They're all program robots over there. But Adam Klasfeld is reporting for long crime on the Bannon sentencing proceeding. And he tells us that Corcoran is now up. Bannon's defense lawyer takes the podium and he says that he starts speaking. He addressed a discreet legal issue very briefly and then he's gone. Doesn't even get a tweet. Darn it. So Schoen comes up now. And so Schoen, as we have seen him before, he's a very passionate guy. Uh, he represented Trump in one of the, I think the second impeachment trial. And we've seen a lot of him. And I think that's how you say his name. I'm not positive though. Now he says, Mr. Bannon should be treated like any other citizen, equal protection of the law, as it were. Schoen claims that he hasn't been repeating the same argument that his client followed the advice of his lawyer. This is the Licavoli case, which is going to be appealed. But Schoen, as Adam sort of uh, emotively conjugates for us, he's going with a closing pitch of remorselessness. <laughs> so, so Adam, you know, Adam is a, um, I, I don't think he's a Steve Bannon fan. We'll just leave it at that. He says, it's a case in which, quite frankly, Mr. Bannon should make no apology. This is Schoen arguing on behalf of Bannon. He says, Your Honor, there is nothing even here to deter. There's nothing here to punish. If you're trying to deter Bannon's conduct, well, that would run counter to constitutional principles. Why? Because Bannon was only following the advice of his lawyer. And we want people to follow the advice of their lawyer. Why? Because people are entitled to their lawyer. Thank you, U.S. Constitution. So if Bannon is doing that and he's working with his licensed lawyers and they're telling him that we advise you to do this, that, and the other thing because we're relying on DOJ memoranda. We're relying on case precedent. We're relying on all sorts of other legal authorities in order to come up with our conclusions. And you can trust us because we're your counsel. Bannon takes that advice and that is not allowed even in as a defense because of precedent in this case called Licavoli. Now, Judge Carl J. Nichols, this judge who did the sentence throughout this trial, he made the point numerous times saying that he thinks that that standard is wrong. The Licavoli standard is wrong, saying that you cannot use that defense, the advice of counsel defense. Judge Nichols confirmed that. He says, you know, I mean, if it goes up and it, they reverse this, I would probably agree with the reversal, but it's the law. I can't do anything about it now. And so therefore, Bannon, sorry, you didn't get to make the argument. So Bannon had to sit on his hands and present no defense at all. So Schoen comes out and he says, hey, Bannon was just doing the, the thing that he should be doing. And we're punishing him for this? And you see that Klasfeld says, Bannon's legal arguments have been roundly rejected by the presiding Trump appointed judge, which I disagree with. I don't think that is actually true. The judge has said, that yes, you can't use that argument. Yes, I mean, it, it is true. It has been rejected, but the judge, but the way he phrases it here makes it seem like those arguments are without merit. That's not true at all. The judge has in, said specifically that this might be an appealable issue that comes back down and reverses this whole thing. But Schoen continues. He says, your honor, Bannon was just doing what the constitution, what he understood the constitution permitted him to do. And he was working with lawyers about this. His lawyers were sending letters back and forth. It wasn't like Bannon got these subpoenas and put them on an email server and then deleted them. He didn't do that at all. He was actually responding to them and sending them back and forth. He was communicating with people over these things. But he gets charged with crimes. Schoen continues, he says, that's the kind of conduct that you should encourage in this country, relying on your lawyer. He says, and by the way, you know, the January 6th committee is a partisan political agenda with no interest in investigation, which is actually 100% true. It is a political body, illegally constituted, that is going after political opponents with token Republicans who are not even going to be there next year. Schoen continues, he says, quite passionately. And Judge Nichols is scribbling notes, looking expressionless, playing that poker face, going through this very slowly. 
He continues. Showin says, Your Honor, this is an outrageous overreach of the prosecution. He's looking around at the audience and he stops himself as he references James Madison, probably from the Federalist Papers, talking about the separation of powers. Showin says, Madison went on to discuss, and he's probably quoting at length from them. He says, this won't go, go on too long, Your Honor. But he talks about his resume representing Democrats saying, Judge, I've worked for both sides. There's been people on both wings of this political spectrum that I've represented. And it's not supposed to be political. But this one is. These prosecutors are trying to make Steve Bannon their trophy. Says it's not deterring behavior. One of the points of sentencing somebody, one of the goals of the criminal justice system is to reform behavior. And how do we do that? We punish somebody to create a deterrence effect so they don't do it again. You get charged with the DUI, Arizona, you spend a day in jail. Our law firm can help you with that. But if you go to jail, the theory is you don't like it and you don't do it again. Here, they're saying Bannon was doing everything correctly. He was literally doing it by the book. He got a subpoena from a fake, illegally constituted garbage committee. He hired lawyers. He took it over to the DOJ, went to their website, for example, got the memoranda, got the precedent, and did what his lawyers told him to do. You want to deter people from doing that? You want to tell people don't do that, just sort of act like lunatics and just, I don't know, show up to... Uh, you know, government partisan hack committees. That's not America. The lawyer claimed here, showing that Bannon took a principled stand and Bannon followed his lawyer's advice. The judge interrupts him. He says, okay, well, um, well, what if Mr. Costello, Bannon's lawyers, who was representing him at the time, what if he had produced non-privileged documents? You know, he said executive privilege was a thing and he couldn't talk because of executive privilege, but what if there was other documents that he could have turned over there, right? Couldn't that have resolved some of this stuff? And the judge says, he hasn't done that, right? No non-privileged documents have been over there. And he says, correct, uh, let me explain that. He says, I've said before in this situation that where a defendant acts on principle and reasonable, valid principle, judge, he doesn't deserve a punishment. Now, the message to the public is that executive privilege is important and I must honor it. And Bannon's saying, I'm not above that law. He says that the government has lied, flat out lied to get Mr. Costello's telephone records referring to Bannon's other lawyer. He says, that's a lie to a federal judge. That means the integrity of this process. And he says that this committee, the one that issued the subpoena is a purely partisan political body and that his client is speaking the truth about the illegitimate committee, which is true. Schoen continues. He says, there's a government me memo saying that there's no greater contempt than Bannon's a more egregious contempt of Congress would have been, screw you, Congress, take your subpoena and shove it, is what Bannon says. Now, show and finishes. Nichols, the judge, gave Bannon an opportunity to speak. Bannon says, thank you, Your Honor. My lawyers have spoken for me. Short recess. The court comes back. Judge Nichols is now out. He takes the bench. All rise. Please be seated. Judge Nichols speaks. He says, the events of January 6 were undeniably serious. He talks about the rioters. He says, many people use violence against law enforcement officers and they engaged in vandalism. The January 6 committee thus has every reason to investigate what happened that day or what they caused that day or whatever. Nichols continues. He says, Mr. Bannon, however, has not produced a single document to the committee. 
And at the time of the subpoena, Bannon was a private citizen who was not employed. And he hadn't been in the executive branch for several years. And even though in July of this year, former President Trump removed the executive privilege barrier, Bannon still didn't produce the documents. And this cuts in favor of a substantial sentence. The judge continues. He says, I know that Bannon did find a lawyer. And although his counsel's advice may have been overly aggressive or misguided, he says, yeah, this is an argument in his favor. Nichols goes through the biography. He says, okay, Bannon, he's done a bunch of this. He's done a naval service. He's uh, worked over at Breitbart. He went to Harvard. He's a smart guy. He's accomplished all sorts of stuff. No criminal history at all. We went through all of that yesterday. And he also worked for Trump. Ah, oh, that's the fatal flaw. The judge continues. And as I stated earlier, though, despite all of that, that very impressive pedigree, Mr. Bannon has not taken responsibility for his actions. So Nichols, the judge says, I find that general deterrence to dissuade this stuff is more important than specific deterrence. So the public needs to know rather than Bannon needs to know. We're going to punish Bannon so everybody else out there knows. You better show up when the January 6th Select Committee sends you a note. Lest you too be convicted and sentenced to four months prison. Bannon says, respect for Congress is of course an important piece of our constitutional system. And that's why I am sentencing you to four months of prison from Judge Nichols. Now we have a little bit more from Sarah Lynch, who closes it out for us as well. And she adds a little bit more flavor to the closing statement of Judge Nichols. Nichols returns from his chambers and takes the bench and says Bannon has not provided any documents and said that as a private citizen, he was even less likely to have privilege. He says there were some records for where there was no conceivable claim of executive privilege and maybe he could have given them those documents. And while his counsel's advice was overly aggressive, it's not enough. The judge says, the committee did not attempt to sue Bannon civilly. Instead, the committee moved quickly to hold him in contempt and pursue criminal prosecution. And Bannon has not ever accepted responsibility for any of this, but, but he has been compliant with the conditions of his release. Every time we've told him to come back, he has. Every time he's told us to update him about his whereabouts, he has. But flaunting congressional subpoenas betrays a lack of respect for the legislative branch. Oh, okay. Is that a crime? <laughs> really? And so he says, four months in prison if you don't respect your Congress. A fine of $6,500. But Bannon does not need to go into custody right now. We'll delay the imposition of the sentence if he files a notice of appeal on time or else he has to self-surrender to the Bureau of Prisons in mid-November. Completed, reported by both Adam Klasfeld at Long Crime and Sarah Lynch at Reuters, giving us the details from the sentencing hearing. And so four months, obviously, is a big prison sentence, not one that many were expecting. After the sentencing proceeding, Steve Bannon addressed the public. Of course, he is getting four months in prison unless the Court of Appeals does something to reverse this, but he doesn't seem perturbed. He's got a big message for the Biden administration and the American people. 
my direction. Yeah. H- hang on. I, I, I want to. <clears throat> by the way, I want to say one thing. I, I respect uh, the judge. The sentence he came down with today is his decision. I fully respect. I've been totally respectful of this entire process uh, on the legal side. I also want to make one other statement before I talk about a broader topic. More than any person in the Trump administration, I testified before the Mueller Commission for more hours. I testified in front of uh, Chair Schiff in the House Intelligence Committee more than any other person in the Trump administration. I, attest- I testified in front of the Senate Intelligence, I think more than any, all about the issues related uh, to, uh, to Russia Gate and to all of that, okay? The same process every time. I had lawyers that were engaged, they worked through the issues of privilege, and at that time I went and testified. And, I, and, and this thing about uh, I'm above the law is an absolute and total lie. Now, more importantly. Bannon saying, I've testified many times. I've got no problem testifying. We go through the formalities. My lawyers tell me what to do and I do it. They told me in this case not to do it. Why? Because of executive privilege and all of the other precedent that was established by the DOJ and the FBI and all of the other case law that supports it. And he has a track record to support that. Mueller and others, happy to talk to you people when it's legitimate, when it's not a political partisan hack. More importantly, the judge, today was my judgment day by the judge, and he stated for the appeal, and we'll have a very vigorous appeals process. I've got a great legal team, and there'll be multiple areas of appeal. But as that sign says right there, can we have the vote sign? On November 8th. On November 8th, on November 8th, there's going to have judgment on the illegitimate Biden regime and quite frankly, and quite frankly, Nancy Pelosi and the entire committee. And we know which way that's going. Either they've already been turfed out like Liz Cheney, right, or have quit like Kinzinger and other Democrats, or they're about to be beaten like Luria and others, or they will lose their power and become a minority and Nancy Pelosi and, and uh, Tom's Chairman Thompson, all of it. This is a, this is a, this is democracy. This is democracy. The American people are way in measuring what went on with the Justice Department and how they comported themselves. They're weighing and measuring that right now and they will vote on November 8th. They will, hang on, they will vote, hang on, they will, they will know, they will know, they, 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 can I go ahead and finish? Can I, thanks? They, on November 8th, on November 8th, the American people will raise judgment and we will broom the Biden administration ends on the 8th evening of the 8th of November. And let me be, let me, some other thing is that the Department of Justice, Merrick Garland, will end up being the first attorney general that's brought up on charges of impeachment and he will be removed from office. Thank you very much. Steve Bannon saying one My direct- way, already been, one already- way, Steve Bannon saying one way to fight back against all of this is to go vote November 8th. It's going to be a big changing of the guard if the Republicans are successful. That happens very soon, early next year. And what happens to the January 6th select committee when that transpires? They're not in charge anymore. Do the Republicans continue with it? Of course they don't. And Steve Bannon says that when that happens, the runway is clear. The right people take over. The investigations switch as the pendulum swings and America sees justice. Of course, we will continue to cover this and follow Steve Bannon and the rest of the political prosecutions that are taking place all across America, unfortunately. I do hope you continue to follow and join us wherever it is you are watching us here today. I look forward to seeing you on the next one.